What we saw really increased adoption and interest in CTV, even from those traditional TV buyers. You know, the, the agencies and media consultants that focus primarily on linear TV, they're looking at how do they carve out budget for CTV as a complement to every linear buy they're doing and how do they think of that as part of their TV strategy, not as a another quirky digital channel. Hi, everyone. It's Wednesday, May 12th. Thanks for listening to the Behind the Numbers ad platform, an e-marketer podcast made possible by VTEX. I'm your host, Principal Analyst Nicole Perrin, and this is my platform to talk about advertising with some of the smartest and most interesting people I know. Joining me to do that today is a past guest, Grace Briscoe, who's the SVP Candidates and Causes at Centro. Hey, Grace, how's it going? Good. Thanks so much for having me back. Yeah, well, thank you for returning. Before we get going with the main part of the conversation, we're experimenting with a new way to kind of set up the episode a little bit. So I've got a couple of quick fire opening questions for you, Grace. First, tell us a little more about Centro. What kind of companies are your clients and what's the main problem you're trying to help them solve? So Centro is a digital ad tech and services company, and we've built a unified process automation platform basis uh, that really facilitates the whole suite of digital media buying in the paid space, all kinds of digital advertising. And clients can license that for self-serve use, but we also provide a full suite of services and have a really fantastic services team across the country to provide all of those paid digital buying services within basis for clients. And Centro as a whole works with all different types of consumer and B2B clients across all verticals. But as you mentioned, I oversee our candidates and causes team, which is a division of about 30 people across the country, which is focused specifically on political, public affairs, issue advocacy kind of clients. Awesome. Awesome. And now second question is about you. Before the show, I shared with you eMarketer's estimates of daily average media consumption by U.S. adults. So can you tell listeners, what's a media channel where you're an outlier, whether that's because you consume more or less than the typical U.S. adult? Well, I feel like the first thing I noticed, uh, and maybe it's not surprising since I work in digital media, but I definitely under-index in traditional. Uh, Mm. I consume about zero traditional media. But within the digital space, I think I weigh under-index for social. I'm not a heavy social user, I'll confess. And I definitely don't use all of the... I No TikTok, no Snap for me. I just can't. It's too much. But I'm way over indexing in podcasts, especially the last year and probably in in CTV too. Podcasts became my new thing during like during work from home that when I'm not on calls and I'm doing work, I'm listening to hours of podcasts a day. Awesome. We have a woman after my own heart here on the show today. I'm not sucking up, I promise. Well, I'm not, like the podcast is only one part of that, but I'm also someone else who really under indexes for social networking. I don't really use that many social networks. I definitely don't spend that kind of time. I don't even think I qualify at this point as a monthly Facebook user. So I'm way under indexing (laughs) on the social side. (laughs) I'm with you. I'm glad I'm not alone. It's okay. You're not alone. It's a safe space here for the non-social people. Awesome. So we're going to talk mostly about political and mostly about advertising. So let's get into it, Grace. Digital political ad spending has been increasing with every election cycle as consumers have continued to spend more and more of their media time, as we're talking about, with digital channels. And it's become easier for political advertisers to reach them there at scale. So you recently wrote a blog post for Centro about what you had seen during the last year's election cycle. And as you discussed in that post, there was a lot about the election that was unprecedented. Just for one example, we had record turnout during a pandemic. But you found that one thing that looked pretty normal was the distribution of political digital ad spending over time. So can you talk a little bit about what that looked like? Yeah, this is one of those times where I made a prediction and I was completely wrong. And my my husband will love hearing me say that I was wrong. So that's for you, Craig. 
But when, when we talked last year, even I was really expecting that given extended early vote periods, this at the expanded access to vote by mail, focus on driving turnout in a pandemic that we were going to see this earlier spend trend yep. to drive that early vote and that campaigns were not going to hang on to their money for the like big blast right before Election Day the way they often do. But I was totally wrong. We did see a slight uptick in spending like early in September and, and into October, a little bit more than maybe we normally would. But trend lines overall did not look substantially different. And at the end of it, I mean, we saw... I think 55% of total spend was in the last 30 days and 25% in the last 10 days before election day, which is even more than we saw in 2018. So, yeah, well, you know, just to to take some of the, you know, blame off you, you were not the only one who was wrong about this. (laughs) I think it was really kind of the consensus opinion last year that because Usually that huge concentration right at the end is, you know, it's get out the vote, which happens mostly on Election Day in person, which means that you're trying to do it really right down to the wire. But everyone last year thought there's going to be lots more mail in ballots, which means you need to reach those people before Election Day, weeks before, even potentially a month or more before. And yet, for whatever reason, there was still this massive get out the vote right down to the wire. I don't know if you have any theories about like why that might have been, whether it was just a matter of people had somehow like not run through their whole budget and they still had it and they wanted to spend it or what? I think there may be some of that. I do think, like I said, we did see this little uptick in spending in September where I do think campaigns were conscious of getting out ahead of early vote and some of that messaging around requesting mail-in ballots and getting them in and all of that. And then maybe it's last minute fundraising. Maybe Uh it's unallocated funds. I can't explain it. I don't know. Everything I know is anecdotal. So I don't know the overall reasons. But uh, but yeah, we still did see those big bursts. I mean, no, I mean, there there was still a lot of in-person voting. There was, uh, of course. in, In November. So yeah, they were really trying to drive that. Yep. So back in the 2018 midterm cycle, 5% of the programmatic political ad spending on Centro's platform went to connected television, or CTV. In last year's cycle, that share almost quadrupled to 19%. So why has CTV become so much more attractive to political advertisers over just the last two years? I think there's a number of converging trends there. There's the scale. We saw such growth in, in CTV use and on uh, time spent and all of that was a big story last year of the just the volume of viewers went up so much, which creates expanded inventory and more access there and scale. The availability and sort of accessibility of the inventory through programmatic channels, um, I think that was a bit of a barrier. I think scale and sort of that accessibility were barriers maybe in 2016 and even into 2018 where it's a fragmented space. And so it was difficult to get that aggregated reach that you wanted. And then, you know, I think it's just this, there's the undeniable consumer trend piece of it that it became more acceptable that, you know, even if you were the most traditional sort of risk averse campaign manager on a, on a political campaign, you knew you needed to at least consider CTV. I mean, it adoptions everywhere, it's not just young people. It's not just big cities. It's my parents in their 70s in Tennessee. They're watching connected TV. And there's a lot of people that you're not going to reach through linear TV, as we've seen some of that audience erode. So CTV became a, a must buy instead of a, an interesting, maybe nice to have. Yeah, I, you know, I, I you, you mentioned all of the factors that I could think of increasing audience, spending more time with CTV, better availability, especially programmatically, and accelerated cord cutting and less linear TV viewing kind of on the other side of the equation. My parents have also cut the cord. My parents are CTV viewers. Yeah, no, I mean, we estimate here at eMarketer that about a third of U.S. households are not reachable on linear TV anymore. And I think political campaigns definitely were aware of that prior to the advent of the pandemic. But then when that came, it just kind of really emphasized that much more 
digital screen time for consumers, accelerated cord cutting under you know the economic pressures of the pandemic. And of course, like less TV viewing because of the pandemic related things that were going on, like no live sports, no mm-hmm. Olympics. You know, these are places where you would have had big mass reach traditional TV events and the audiences just kind of weren't there the way they traditionally would be. And all of these factors drove a bit of an exodus from the traditional TV ad market, you know, in terms of regular brands as well as political spend, partly because that spend's not that liquid, it's not that flexible, it has to be planned really far in advance, and CTV is the opposite of all of that, right? A lot of that is true. And I do think, I mean, you know, political campaigns still spent big in linear TV. Oh, yeah. They have not like a, a divorced TV as a channel of choice for sure. But we saw really increased adoption and interest in CTV, even from those traditional TV buyers, you know, the, mm-hmm. the agencies and media consultants that focus primarily on linear TV, they're looking at how do they carve out budget for CTV as a complement to every linear buy they're doing? And how do they think of that as part of their TV strategy, not as a another quirky digital channel? Yeah, well, that's really interesting to hear in particular. I know something that we're always kind of curious about and thinking about is to what extent the linear TV and digital video are being bought by the same teams as opposed to linear TV and this traditional team with the digital video with the digital team. So that's that's super interesting for sure. We're going to talk more about video in a second. But first, let me just have a quick word from our sponsor, VTEX. Retail's next competitive threat may come from a business model or channel that didn't even exist a few months ago. This modern dynamic requires companies to adapt quickly, pivoting business seemingly overnight, something traditional commerce platforms just can't support. There's a new enterprise commerce platform on the rise, one that's fast, flexible, and doesn't require nine months and a million dollars to get up and running. Go to vtex.com slash emarketer, that's v-t-e-x dot com slash emarketer to learn more. Awesome. Back with Grace Briscoe to talk more about what political advertisers were up to in digital media last year. So Grace, let's talk more broadly about video. We were just talking about CTV specifically, but broadening out to the whole digital video world. More than 70% of political digital ad spend on Centro's platform went to video. So what are some of the most important channels or specific ad platforms where that video spend went and what makes them popular? So, I mean, yes, video is a, a longstanding love of political campaigns. As we were talking about going back to that TV as a traditional tentpole, and they've definitely expanded that to digital video and now into CTV. Video is really central to the way that a campaign typically thinks about shaping its creative narrative. They're thinking about the TV spots as the central the piece sight, of that. sound, and motion. Yeah, Marketers' yeah, it, greatest love. <laughs> it's and, it, and it's true. You know, video provides a much better opportunity for emotional connection and that persuasion that political candidates and campaigns are trying to make with voters. A display ad just doesn't have that same impact. So often they're looking about, you know, video is the sort of core of it and maybe display is reinforcing those messages and building Mm -hmm. that frequency. But video is super central to it. And I think, you know, as we were talking about, CTV is a big piece of the increase we saw in video. But But overall, the scale and availability of different types of video inventory in programmatic have expanded greatly. And we saw political clients taking advantage of that, whether it's kind of outstream formats, native video, you know, outside of just the traditional pre-roll inventory. There's really sort of some expanded formats and a lot of access to inventory. Cool. In terms of outstream, is that like, for example on social where it's like an in-feed video? Is it also like other types of websites, like maybe a news property with outstream video in article? There's a lot of that. Yeah. The sort of in-read formats that are in the midst of editorial content, the the in-feed formats that that can even be across different types of news sites and sort of embedded in that like homepage feed of news articles. And then, yeah, obviously social video, Big thing, it's such a sort of limited time span 
place that, you know, for social, I do think campaigns where they were successful, we're definitely thinking about using shorter formats, quicker hits, different things, not repurposing the 30 second TV spots. Yeah. Doesn't, doesn't play so well on social. Yeah. That makes, I mean, it makes sense. We've heard that, you know, for years for, for all types of marketing. What about like other types of mobile apps is like, you know, were they advertising with video and mobile games and stuff like that? Or are we not quite there yet? <laughs> no, I we did. We absolutely see a lot. I mean, in mobile video consumption is up. We know it across, you know, different channels. And I think we did see, I don't think we saw necessarily campaigns where we're specifically seeking out, like, how do I get more video inventory in games? But they were very open to, I'll buy the eyeballs and the video, you know, across whatever apps, channels, places make sense, uh, wherever I can get them. That's really interesting. Very interesting. Cool. So going beyond just video, you also published a list of the leading platforms overall where your clients were spending digital political ad budgets. The top three were Facebook, Hulu, and YouTube. That order might surprise some people with Hulu kind of stuck in there in between Facebook and YouTube, right? And you wrote that YouTube dropped in the ranks from number one in the 2018 midterm cycle to number three in last year's presidential cycle, most likely because of its restrictions on political ads. So let's just start with kind of the main point. Remind people about YouTube's restrictions, which were relatively recently introduced, like for the 2020 election, essentially, right? They were, yes. They were announced, I think, at late 2019, if I remember correctly. That's what um, I remember also. Yeah. And so just as we were sort of heading into the 2020 cycle, um, and what they did was just put some restrictions on what types of targeting political campaigns could use and basically eliminated any kind of first-party data, third-party data, retargeting anything like hyper local or anything narrower than a zip code, I think. Um, so all you can do is basically some, you know, basic geo targeting and really basic demographic like age and gender and some contextual targeting. But eliminating all of that, you know, retargeting and voter file targeting and those things that political campaigns really value. Yeah, uh, definitely. A lot of campaigns took a step away. Yeah. So that's the specific restrictions on YouTube. Other platforms had other restrictions. I think most of them in terms of the targeting were probably a lot less onerous than YouTube. Can you talk about how you saw advertisers react to the restrictions that various platforms impose? What did they do? Well, and I think it definitely is part of the story, the shifts that we saw in direct buying with vendors. They were really interesting. We saw that slip in YouTube's share of spend. And we also saw a shift with Facebook, like Facebook moved from, they went, they did go from number two to number one as far as share of spend, but their actual share of spend dropped by more than 10% from 2018. So Interesting. campaigns were definitely still using Facebook, but I think they rolled out a number of different policies and processes and approval yeah. processes that were kind of lengthy. And then those sort of last minute blackout periods and ad bans really made a lot of political clients, I think, very create a lot of anxiety um, mm -hmm. and a lot of unease about being overly reliant on any single platform that could pull the rug out from under you at any second. Yeah. Well, and especially like you said, there are approval processes. So, you know, if you're a political advertiser on Facebook, unlike a quote unquote normal brand, you can't just like set the ad up, hit buy and it starts running, right? You have a wait. So if it's your urgent down to the wire, get out the vote, like maybe it just doesn't make sense. And also they had these blackout periods. They stopped approving new ads as we got right down to election and day. And that ended up being super chaotic and a big oh, yeah. mess because of course they said, yeah, we're not going to approve any new ad creative after this time. So there was a glut of, you know, thousands of campaigns uploading thousands of creative to get them in approved <laughs> under the wire. And they had no process to approve all of that. So of course, of and course, yes, there was it was madness. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because, you know, we only started estimating political ad spending at the end of 2019. And when I interviewed people to support that forecast in the fall of 2019, it was really clear to me and to us that 
political advertisers were more reliant on the duopoly in terms of the share of their digital spend than the average. And then both of the main duopoly players put lots more restrictions on what they could do. And their share of political ad spend dropped as a result. And you're seeing, you know, Hulu ends up as number two, which, you know, is certainly not like the number two overall ad platform in the country on digital. And and like you said, even though Facebook moved up a slot, it has less share. And so that means essentially that there is like a longer tail. There's more fragmentation in terms of, of political advertisers, digital spend. There's less consolidation at the top. Exactly. And I do think we saw, again, that that CTV factor of, of Hulu popping up even higher on the list, but also of the top 10, the new sites that we saw pop up into the top 10 for direct spending, five of them were at least driven in part by CTV. You know, we were seeing vendors like Tegna and, and Roku and Samba jumping up onto that list of top 10 direct vendors. That's That's definitely a CTV factor. Yeah, really interesting. Any other points that you would just like to note in terms of different ways that they were kind of directing their ad budgets last year and what you're looking for next time around? We saw Snap make the list of top 10 for the first time. And that was definitely, that's partially, I think, clients actively looking to test some different things, Mm -hmm. especially different social channels outside of Facebook and Instagram. And knowing that Twitter had totally banned political yep. ads, you know, channels are kind of restricting. So, but it's interesting because we had really, we'd seen very little interest from clients campaigns on testing things like Snap because it was considered too young, too whatever, too risky, to whatever. That now we're, we're actually seeing, we saw campaigns using Snap and finding really great results, um, feeling like it really worked well for them. So I think we're going to see more and more of that And I think we are seeing this year more of that experimentation of making sure they're testing different tactics, trying different things, different channels, and not being so totally reliant on a couple of places. Yeah, well, I'm really interested to see where that continues to lead. And, you know, especially kind of new creative ideas that come out of, you know, going beyond such a concentration on the duopoly that they've had in the past. Absolutely. It's going to be interesting. It's definitely going to be interesting. And I'm sure that you'll be on again to tell us all about it. We're so glad to have you back. That's all that we have time for on today's episode of the Behind the Numbers ad platform, an e-marketer podcast made possible by Vtex. Grace, thank you again so much for chatting today. Thank you so much for having me. And I will come back anytime. Let me know. Awesome. And thanks to you all for listening. I'll be back next week with the next episode of the ad platform. And in the meantime, please continue to let us know what you think at podcast at emarketer.com. Thanks. Thanks.